We're here today with uh, Paul LeBlanc, who is a long-time socialist in the United States, and uh, this is uh, an interview by Green Left in Australia. I would like to start by acknowledging that we are meeting, or at least the interview is being conducted here on stolen Aboriginal land, and uh, we recognise that that uh, sovereignty has never been ceded, and, and, and we pay our respects to the traditional owners and pledge our ongoing support for you know, for the cause of justice. Um and we're, we're going to have a discussion today about the, the United States elections, which are looming up now in less than a month. Last week, we had the, the first, and uh, who knows, it may be the only presidential debate between Trump and Biden. That debate was notable for the fact that Trump refused to disavow white supremacy. And in, uh, in response to the call to do so, he actually made a call to the Proud Boys to stand by, uh, which was interpreted by them as an expression of support. Um, and that combined with Trump's refusal to actually commit to accepting the results of the election and the increased organisation and confidence of the far-right forces in the US, I think is leading to, I think it's fair to say is leading to more and more concern and legitimate concern that the US could be descending into fascism. However, you know, those of us who have been around the left for some time know that the word fascism is often thrown around fairly liberally, um, often used as an epithet rather than a, a, a clear precise political descriptor. So perhaps we could just begin by discussing exactly what we mean by the by the fascism, or at least what you, know, you and I mean when we talk about fascism. So could you just start by explaining what is the sort of the classical Marxist conception of, of fascism? Well, um, Marxists look at the experience, particularly in uh, Italy, with uh, the fascist movement developed uh, by uh, Benito Mussolini and his co-thinkers, and in Germany, uh, looking at uh, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi movement, those around him building the Nazi movement, and in each case, these became mass movements and uh, they took power. Uh, in each case, uh, they... Uh, were nurtured by some uh, powerful uh, economic and political forces, uh, sectors of the capitalist class. Uh, and this took place in a context in both situations where there were revolutionary possibilities with large working class movements, socialist uh, communist movements. Um, and um, uh, there was uh, in counterposition to this uh, extreme nationalist and authoritarian ideologies that were developed as part of these uh, highly organized movements, uh, appealing to uh, patriotism, uh, uh, often and particularly in Germany, to uh, various forms of racism, uh, militarism, um, a total rejection of democracy, uh, and a promise to establish authoritarian leaderships that would bring their countries to greatness, make them great again or make them great for the first time. Um, and uh, so those were the kinds of things uh, uh, related to those fascist movements. Uh, they used uh, uh, violence, extreme violence, uh, first in the streets with paramilitary groups that were part of their movements. Uh, and then uh, uh, they had some support of oppressive uh, uh, forces in the state. And then they, uh, in each case, they took over the state and uh, used uh, force and violence uh, and horrific repression against actual and perceived and potential enemies. Um, so that's, uh, that's what we see uh, uh, in the history uh, in, in each case, there's a populist type rhetoric, um, uh, sometimes even a, 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 an anti-capitalist uh, tinge in the rhetoric. Uh, and at the same time, they maintained capitalism and smashed the, uh, the uh, workers' movements in both countries. Um, so those, were, those are some of the, uh, the things that... Uh, uh, we see in the uh, experience in Germany and in Italy, uh, and in both cases also extreme uh, social and economic uh, and political crises form the context within which uh, the fascist movements uh, arose and, and became uh, powers in their own countries. So that brings up the question of the current Trump regime. I mean, in what ways do you think uh, what's happening in the United States at the moment mirrors that experience in the past, and in what ways is it different? 
Yeah, I think um, one thing that's important is uh, in the United States, uh, since very early on, uh, there were racists, there were authoritarians, there were people who, uh, you know, were reactionary in their politics. Some of them had a lot of power. You had the Confederate States of America, uh, you know, at the time of the Civil War fighting for slavery. Um, and uh, we can find that kind of continuity through U.S. history. Um, and we can look at uh, the 19... 50s, the 1960s, right, far right movements, um, you know, uh, Senator Joe McCarthy, various other things like that, the John Birch Society. Uh, it seems to me that now, uh, and for as long as I've been alive, there has not been a situation such as the one that exists today, uh, where there are uh, far right movements uh, or organizations um, that have weapons, that have um, uh, you know, various uh, extreme ideological pronouncements going one way or the other. Some of them identify with, uh, with the Nazi and fascist movements of the past. Some of them use a different rhetoric. But there's an authoritarianism uh, and uh, often a racism and a misogyny and uh, you know, those kinds of things are more pronounced. Um, and then, of course, another thing that's quite different is there's a president of the United States who is uh, an open bully, bigot, authoritarian, uh, who is appealing to and coddling and, uh, uh, you know, establishing some kind of relationship with these kinds of groups that are growing. Um, so in those ways, uh, there are some similarities uh, and it's, it's serious. Um, there are some far right wing elements and uh, uh, authoritarian and racist uh, uh, elements and violent elements within the police departments throughout the United States uh, and in the military. Um, not at the top levels of the military that I can see, but um, you know, there's, uh, this is something uh, that um, uh, seems to me to be very serious. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, is in part a reaction against a systemic racism uh, and, and violent and murderous violence on the part of many policemen. There's a subculture there. There's a sort of an ideology there that sustains that kind of violence against black people. There's always been a racism, but it seems to me there's an uptick. Um, so that people who are talking about the possibility of fascism, uh, they're pointing to these kinds of things. Um, and uh, also to the, uh, the crisis that we're in, the set of crises that we are in, uh, that uh, include uh, the uh, uh, coronavirus uh, spread and uh, uh, the uh, economic downturn, and even in some ways the environmental crisis which is hitting us. Uh, so that um, all that seems solid to many people once upon a time seems to be melting in air. Um, there is a, f a growing amount of fear and uh, uh, anxiety among large numbers of people. And some are moving in a right-wing direction in, in reaction to that and in response to what's being put out in the rhetoric, in the outlook of the presidents of the United States, uh, Trump, uh, and uh, some of these other groups that I've been mentioning. So all of this combines to uh, alert people to you know, dangers and uh, some have argued that um, uh, we're approaching an American style of fascism. I think that um, uh, that's uh, some of the reality, but there are other, uh, other aspects to the reality that make this different uh, from uh, the kind of thing that we've seen in, in Europe in the past, uh, the fascist movements in Europe. Um, and uh, one thing is, uh, if you take a look at Trump, first of all, um, he is absorbed, he uh, self-absorbed, he is shallow, 
um, he is old. He's 74 years old. Now, when uh, Hitler joined the, what, the early uh, crystallization of the Nazi movement, he was in his early 30s. When he took power, he was in his early 40s. Uh, you find uh, Mussolini slightly older, but a similar kind of thing. So this is, uh, and they were part of their fascist movements, helping to shape them and so forth, very hands-on uh, from the beginning, pretty much. Um, Trump isn't like that. He's, uh, he's uh, more fly-by-night uh, than, than that, um, and uh, more shallow. Uh, more self-absorbed, as I, as I said before. And you could argue, well, Hitler was in his own way and Mussolini was in his own way, but they were an organic part of highly organized movements. What became and what they helped to uh, forge as highly organized movements with a developed ideology, with a subculture, with a, a coherent organization that doesn't exist uh, in the United States. It's, uh, there's the potential this could crystallize into that kind of movement, but it isn't there yet. Um, at the same time, it's a very dangerous situation. I don't think Trump is going to be the leader of a fascist movement that uh, takes over the United States, but it's not inconceivable that in the near future, such leaders will emerge from this incohate, uh, you know, pre-fascist development, uh, you know, it, uh, some of these folks are consciously fascist, but some, uh, some not. But it, it could turn into that. There is that potential. And Trump's uh, rhetoric, Trump's policies, his uh, actions have nurtured that and helped to um, uh, advance that. I think once Trump goes, and it's possible he'll lose the election, quite possible he'll lose the election, but that won't eliminate the problem. The problem is here to stay for some time. And the crises that we're going through, uh, the Democratic Party liberals, the corporate liberals who dominate the Democratic Party, they don't have solutions to these problems. They help to bring about these problems. In a way, people uh, going towards Trump uh, was because the establishment politicians of both parties didn't seem to have answers and Trump claimed to have answers. So uh, with Trump gone, that won't mean that this danger is gone. The danger will continue to grow. Well, I guess if we do look towards the elections, um, which, uh, you know, uh, the United States and other countries as well, but I mean, almost, I think every election since the 1960s and probably beforehand, there's been a split between uh, moderates who fall in behind the Democratic Party and radicals who who more or less argue the case of, you know, we, we can't support the lesser evil. Um, I mean, in some ways, if there ever was a case for less, for supporting the lesser evil, this feels like you probably couldn't find a better example than this one. But it does it does raise the question of what leftists should be doing in this election campaign, and I'm, and I'm sure, no doubt, well, there are obviously different points of view about exactly that. The way it seems to me, the, the difficulty is... Uh, framed around a, 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 a dilemma of what I would describe as two what seem to be unassailable, unassailable truths, but they lead, lead to contradictory conclusions. The first is, as you just explained, there is a, there is a genuine and significant danger of Trump using a close election result as a pretext to steal the election, um, including... Uh, by mobilising an increasingly confident and violent far-right base. And, I mean, whatever you said about the age of Trump or whatever, I think that's in some ways, that feels to me like superficial superficialities. There actually is, there is a, there is a violent and, um, and increasingly confident right-wing base and, and it is crystallising around Trump. Um, mm -hmm. And in this context, um, you know, if Trump is re-elected, whatever you say about you know the technicalities of of, of what it uh, of what his uh, politics are and what the, what that would represent, there there can be no debate that that would be a continuation of uh, very an escalation of dangerous right wing policies, including on climate and racism, where lives are in, and a lot more are at stake. And the logical conclusion from all of that is that. You know, we should be pushing for the largest possible margin for a Biden victory. Uh, that would uh, curtail Trump's, you know, room for manoeuvre um, in terms of stealing the election. 
And you know, you, you could well say correctly, I think that's not a solution to anything for Biden to win. Um, nevertheless, the argument would go that would be the best way to avoid a terrible outcome. And I think there's, I think that's, I, th- I don't think you can, I think that's there's a lot of truth in that. On the other hand, uh, as I said, the traditional lesser evil argument still applies. Um, if you support any evil, you're still supporting "quote unquote" evil, and uh, and Biden isn't our friend. Uh, he's not he's not even supporting the the uh, you know uh, the moderate sort of social democratic uh, reforms, or at least at least tepidly at best, um, and clearly refusing to break from the establishment. And all those things under Obama are exactly what created the circumstances for Trump in the first place. Um, so y- you could draw from that the conclusion that, well, leftists should be supporting a you know, left-wing break from the Democrats, um, I guess most prominently uh, the Greens campaign by by Howie Hawkins. Um, but, you know, as I said, there's still there's a dilemma of both those points of view, which, which both have a lot of sense in them. So I wonder if you could explain uh, your take on, on, on responding to that situation. Sure, sure. Um, one thing is, uh, for the longest period of time, as I, uh, you know, as I've been uh, in, an activist in the United States, a left-wing activist, I have heard the argument: uh, if we don't elect the Democrat, then we face a fascist danger, um, and that has been inflated uh, rhetoric to corral people into the Democratic Party in my opinion. Uh, at this time, because of what we've uh, been observing, you know, in our, in our conversation, there, there's an element of truth, a strong element of truth that wasn't there before. Uh, something that you said is quite important, and that is uh, the Democratic Party corporate liberal leadership that includes Obama, it includes Biden and so forth. They have no, not, not only do they have no solutions, to the problems that are facing us and the, the, the crises that are facing us, they helped to create them. They were part of creating them. Uh, the reason we're facing the danger from the uh, far right, uh, one major reason is because people are getting desperate looking for solutions that are not being offered by mainstream politics that is uh, uh, committed to maintaining the capitalist system. So those are those are realities. Um, at the same, t- there's another problem, and uh, I I am supportive of the Green campaign of Howie Hawkins, who's a, a socialist, an eco-socialist, putting forward the Green New Deal, and uh, 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 you know, excellent platform, you know, excellent policies. Um, the hard truth is the Green Party has no chance at all of winning. Uh, It will uh, get a marginal number of votes. It's not organized enough. It doesn't have enough organization. It doesn't have enough support. It doesn't have enough resources. And the sad fact is, this is true of the entire left in the United States. If we could pull something together between now and you know, election day in early November, that was a real alternative. It might be worth a discussion, you know, what should we do? But um, that's not going to happen. The only way to defeat Trump is to vote for Biden. And that's not advocating a vote for Biden. That's just a recognition of what the reality is. Um, And there are problems uh, that uh, could form the basis for a movement, a left-wing movement, you know, in regard to racism, in regard to the climate, in regard to the uh, economy. But there is no left-wing movement that is coherent. Uh, There's a potential, but it doesn't exist. Um, And so... um, good people on the left who I I like and respect are uh, bashing each other over, well, should, you know, are are you a renegade if you are supporting Biden, who was a pro-capitalist, imperialist, 
Democrat who is, uh, you know, th there's nothing to be said about him that's uh, persuasive aside from, well, he's not Trump. <laughs> he's not Trump. Um, uh, or, you know, should you do that? Uh, or are you a renegade for doing that? Are you helping to elect Trump if you support uh, uh, Hawkins? Or there are several other socialist candidates who may get a few thousand votes at best. Um, but they're not going to win. They're not going to stop Trump. If Trump wins, um, it will uh, be a defeat for us, for all of us. It will embolden the far right. It will unleash, you know, policies as bad and worse as what we've sub been subjected to uh, over the past four years. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that most left-wing people who are not voting for Trump, and many are, many are voting for Trump, but those who are not, don't want Trump to win. They would like Trump to lose. They're hoping Biden will win and Trump will lose, but they don't want to support Biden for completely understandable and honorable reasons. Now, just to you know, clarify, I, then you said uh, some leftists will be voting for Trump. Did you mean Biden? No, 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 no. I'm, did I say that? I didn't mean to say yeah, that. Okay. Some of the leftists will yeah. be voting for Biden, yeah. uh, you know, and uh, some will be uh, voting against Biden and uh, for not for Trump, but for Howie Hawkins or one of the other socialist uh, candidates uh, or uh, they won't vote. Mm. Um, and and that for, you know, uh, completely understandable reasons. Um, you've got to just say no. Will a Democrat generally, will a liberal Democrat generally be a bit better for us in terms of policies that he or she stands for and, and, and puts forward than a right-wing Republican? Yes. Yes. But by supporting liberal Democrats who are not going to solve the problems, who support capitalism, imperialism, uh, you know, uh, various things that result in a deepening of racism and so forth. If you, if, if you support them, it's a perpetuation of a terrible situation that will result in people desperately looking for alternatives. And if the only alternative is on the right, then some people will go in that direction. Um, some of us uh, supported Sanders. Uh, because he represented a uh, very moderate kind of socialism, but socialism uh, that uh, to the extent that people responded to that and large numbers of people responded to that, that could be the basis for the development of a socialist alternative. Um, and that made a certain amount of sense to me. Uh, supporting Biden will not be a socialist alternative. And people who are talking about it in that way, including Sanders, I mean, he's not saying it'll be a socialist alternative, but he's talking Biden up uh, in ways that uh, I think uh, create illusions about what the realities really will be. Uh, that, you know, that that's unfortunate. Um, the most unfortunate thing is we do not have an organized, coherent, left-wing alternative that has a possibility right now of uh, being a force in, in the current elections. And so it's a no-win situation for people on the left. Uh, and uh, so you have to pick the least bad of several options. Significant numbers of people are choosing to support Biden. Some are not. They're denouncing each other. Uh, in many cases, my own feeling is it's understandable. Both of the positions are understandable. What we have to be looking at uh, is building a left going beyond the election. If Trump wins, that will be horrible and we will have to struggle under those conditions. Uh, if Biden wins, it won't be as horrible, but we it'll still be pretty bad, and we're going to have to struggle under those conditions. But unless we struggle to build a left that's going to uh, provide an alternative and provide uh, uh, struggles that can win, you know, and that can persuade large numbers of people, yes, a better world is possible. We can win. This is worth the fight. Uh, unless we are able to do that, 
um, then there's no hope for the future. Some people like Naomi Klein are are basically putting the argument, which sounds like similar to what you're saying here, that if a Biden is elected, uh, it'll create a better terrain of struggle for the left. Um, is that the, is that is that what you're saying as well? Well, I don't know. I think that if Trump is elected, uh, greater damage will be done, and the right wing will the the far right and the fascist oriented forces will grow stronger. Uh, I think they'll they'll continue to grow if Biden wins because uh, you know things that we've already discussed. But um, uh, it's quite possible that uh, there could be greater repression, greater difficulties. There will be a problem if Biden wins and people on the left heave a sigh of relief and say, okay, we did that. Uh, I've heard some people, uh, good people, uh, good left-wing people who were talking about supporting Biden or, and then pivot and they're expecting he'll win, pivot to oppose Biden once he wins and to build a left-wing alternative. The slogan I've heard is dump Trump, then battle Biden. I Well, I think that's the position of some people. Yeah. Um, and my feeling is regardless of how the election turns out, and I think you can make a strong case both ways, um, but regardless of how the election pans out, it is necessary for us to join together, you know, those of us taking one position or the other, to fight for things like the Green New Deal, to fight for, uh, uh, you know, defunding the police and uh, creating alternatives to uh, vicious, racist, uh, authoritarian police forces, uh, and fighting for the rights of women and fighting for human rights in the broad sense and workers' rights uh, in the deepest sense. We've got to do that. Um, yeah, well, that, that was exactly the final question I was going to ask you. I mean, obviously, the vote is important um, one way or the other. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to minimise it, but you described that, that phenomenon of, of good people arguing different sides of that debate about which side, what side, what position to take on the vote. It seems to me that's only just one aspect. It's an important aspect, but there are other aspects, and surely the grassroots mobilisation um, around things like the Green New Deal and uh, universal health care uh, is, you know, is one aspect and even potentially um, grassroots struggle to defend an election result if it's, if it's a narrow Biden victory and Trump tries to steal it. I mean, uh, what... Uh, all of that. Surely, surely of that, that is the... Surely that's the, the, the best resolution to that kind of debate is to find the, those areas of commonality where, where there can be united struggle. There's another piece to it, uh, to my mind. Um, and that is we've got to build a powerful left and it won't simply be through this good struggle and that good struggle and the other good struggle and will always be opposition movements putting pressure on the powers that be in these good struggles. We've got to build a left-wing movement with strong left-wing organizations, strong organizationally in terms of um, uh, experience and so forth. Um, and support that can provide an alternative in the sense of winning against the capitalist system. And we don't have all the time in the world. Uh, the, uh, the environmental problem uh, will get us even if Trump doesn't, uh, unless we have something like the Green New Deal. Uh, uh, there's uh, not too much time to simply do business as usual, building protest movements. We have to build protest movements. We have to fight for reforms in the here and now, but we must build a strong, powerful socialist movement. And that has to be uh, right at the top of the agenda of any left-wing person, any socialist who's serious about his or her socialism uh, in the United States after the election. Oh, well, thank you very much for that, Paul. Your insights, as, uh, as usual, are very, very helpful. And thanks, everyone, for watching this, uh, this video with Green Left. 
Um, as always, if you can uh, become a supporter of Green Left, that's one of the best ways that you can uh, help support this project and uh, it, it makes a tremendous uh, difference if you can. There's details in the, in the video description. And we've also recently set up a Patreon account. You can support us that way as well. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Paul, for, for giving sharing your insights. And um, we will all be thinking about you, even though it's the other part of the world. I mean, this election is, I think, important for people outside the United States as well as within. Thank you.